You know, before NASCAR was a sport, before it was even an idea, a teenage Raymond Parks knew the value of a fast car. From his roots in running moonshine to NASCAR's first championship team, Parks is truly the godfather of stock car racing. This week, the 94-year-old sat down with our Kyle Petty for his first ever television interview. I've often heard my father talk about how much my grandfather respected Raymond Parks and how his teams were always the ones to be. Decades later, most fans do not even know his name. Raymond Parks is truly a racing pioneer who has spent the last 60 years in NASCAR obscurity. I mean, Raymond really is the sole living keeper of NASCAR's true history because he was there from the early, early days. He was there during that transition from moonshining to stock car racing to the legitimacy of the sport. Is that your championship trophies? Yeah. You did beat them a lot more than they beat you. Yeah. Raymond Parks and his 15 brothers and sisters were born to a poor farming family in the mountains of northern Georgia, just outside of Dawsonville. Moonshine was his finest export. He could make a hundred bucks a week, you know, during the Great Depression or the aftermath of the Great Depression, which was more than, you know, he'd make in months and months of working on the farm or, or in the, one of the mills. According to Raymond and a lot of his uh, family members, he, he rarely took a sip of the stuff himself, which is probably why he's still alive today. The ambitious farm boy moved 60 miles south to Atlanta, the big city watering trough for most of his mountain moonshine. Within two years, the teenager owned his uncle's service station. What was Atlanta like in those days when you first moved down here? Were there a lot of cars in town? Well, it, uh, yeah, I thought it was a lot of big, big, big place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Worked on cars and just anything, but you know, a service station that needed to be done. So you've always liked yeah. aut the automobile. Yeah. Ford V8s came uh, out of the, fa the Ford factory in about 1932. That's when they started producing these heftier, stronger, faster cars. And it was perfectly timed for the Southern Moonshiners. It was fast, it had a huge trunk into which they could cram a bunch of these jars. Uh, it was easy to work on, you know, you'd, you'd take it apart and, and tinker with it and make it go faster than it was meant to be. And what they would do is get together on the weekends, starting out sometimes just at a little cow pasture or, or horse racing track or some little fairgrounds track and race against each other and see who had the fastest moonshining car. Just up the road from Park Service Station was Red Volt's Garage, the backroom birthplace of all the fastest Fords and the moonshine revenuer's nemesis. He developed a reputation early on as, as the bootlegger's mechanic. He's, he's the guy that Raymond Park sent his cars to because Raymond knew he was, he was the best in the business at that time. And so they developed this, this relationship which evolved into a partnership of sorts. What made you get into racing in the first place? Well, I wanted to watch a few races and, and I decided I, would, I had to be in there. And two of the best moonshine racers were Raymond's Dawsonville cousins, the brash and flamboyant Roy Hall, and the quiet, more modest Lloyd C. Who's this picture? Lloyd C. Who's that? Roy. Roy Hall. That's Roy? That's a fancy driver's uniform. I should have drove for you. I could have dressed like that. Uh, yeah. That's the way he come to the track dressed like that. Both Roy Hall and Lloyd C. became folk heroes at a lot of these small towns across the South. Sort of a symbol to other guys of that generation that there's a way to get out of that impoverished life that they were trapped in. People would come hang out at Red's garage just to talk to Red. Yeah, yeah. So Red was like a local celebrity. Was Roy that way and Lloyd that way? Were they celebrities? Yeah. Were you a celebrity? No. <laughs> Why weren't you the celebrity? You were paying the bills. <laughs> Open wheel racing was popular in the North and the Midwest, but was considered a sport for the rich professionals. By the early 1940s, Raymond Parks was already cashing in on a bunch of unruly amateur racers, including the future founder of NASCAR. Why were you, did you decide to put your name on the car? Well, I was in machine business, music, pinball, and advertising in my own business. That's Bill France right there. Yeah, yeah, Bill. Was he a pretty good driver? Yeah. He drove for you? 
several times. Did he tear it up? And oh yeah, one time he tore it all and just about demolished it. And he developed a real, you know, intense sort of competitive relationship with guys like Lloyd C. and Roy Hall. Because as good as Bill France was, and he was a pretty good racer, these guys were always just a little bit better. Just as stock car racing was gaining momentum, World War II slammed the country into chaos. Parks was headed to Germany, a technical sergeant in charge of his company's armored vehicles. How long were you in the, in the service, in the war? No, it was about three years. Yes, sir. So you went overseas and you were at, yeah. the, at the Battle of the Bulge? Well, Battle of the Bulge. Yes, sir. 81,000 American casualties, 100,000 German. The bloodiest engagement of the war. For Parks, more than 100 days entrenched in a foxhole. He spent this uh, dangerous period of time pushing forward into Germany during the horrible winter months. I think his, his company lost half of, of, of its men, um, and, and Raymond, fortunately for him, survived with barely a scratch. Red Byron was not so lucky. The open wheel racer had dabbled in stock car racing before the war. But when his B-24 bomber was shot down, Byron nearly lost his leg. Raymond appreciated his gritty determination and hired Byron to drive his car. Red Vogt welded a couple of pins onto the, the clutch pedal and before a race they would put Red Byron's leg onto the clutch pedal, sort of positioned in between these pins, and when he had to press the clutch, he would turn his body so that the lower half would shift, and his leg brace and the orthopedic boot would then depress the clutch pedal in and out as he needed to change gears. Was it very painful for him? Did he hurt a lot? No, I don't think it was. If it was, he never did complain. <laughs> At the end of one of these races, I mean, his, his overalls would be soaked with blood because of the chafing of this leg brace against his skin, but he was so determined to get back into racing, he, he just made it work. So December 1947, that's when Bill France calls this meeting down in Daytona Beach, inviting all the big figures in stock car racing to kind of meet face to face and come up with a new plan. So that team, Raymond Parks, Red Vogt, Red Byron, were, were crucial to that meeting and crucial to the uh, creation of NASCAR. These early years were very tentative years. As, as we know, nobody was really making any money off this sport as yet. And there were times when uh, they'd hold a race and maybe they didn't have enough money from ticket sales to be able to pay the drivers. By this point, Raymond was, was a legitimate businessman and was very wealthy and was able to maybe loan Bill France some money to pay the drivers and to keep, that, to keep things going. The super team of Raymond Parks, Red Volt, and Red Byron won NASCAR's first two championships in 1948 and 1949. But by now, Bill France was calling all the shots. In 1951, Raymond Parks suddenly disappeared. After you stopped racing, did you ever think about getting back into racing? No. Yeah, because you just went away, you just walked yeah, away I just and... just quit. Yeah, you just quit. Was it hard to quit? Yeah. Was it just getting too expensive to race? Not, not, not pretty expensive. Time I paid the Red Bull, the mechanics, the drivers, and all of I won the race, I'm still in the hole. I think there are probably a bunch of reasons, none of which we'll ever really know. I think Raymond did get the sense that he, he wasn't embraced by the sport and wasn't uh, always given the credit that he felt he was due for helping the sport get off the ground. And so I think that might have played a, a role too in his decision in 1951 to just walk away. Kyle, thank you. A very interesting look at the history of this sport, no doubt. For more on Raymond Parks and all of our Pride of NASCAR stories, check out nascar.com slash TNT. But guys, now we're